This morning we turn one more time to Philippians chapter 2. Please open your Bibles there, the home visitation theme of the elders. We're going to read verses 1 to 16, and we're focusing on 14 to 16. Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him, And given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And here begins our text at verse 14. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast or holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So far the reading of God's holy word. A number of years ago when we were on vacation, we went to some caves in the Ottawa Valley. You could go on a boardwalk where lights had been installed and enjoy the beauty of the cave. At one time, water had poured through it, making various formations and enlarging the opening in the limestone so that you could walk through it. You go about 60 to 100 feet below the surface of the earth and it becomes rather chilly. Then at a certain point in the tour, they tell you that they're going to shut off the lights. When they hit the switch, you find yourself in utter darkness. The sun doesn't shine 60 to 100 feet below the ground. When the lights go off, you can see absolutely nothing. Congregation, the Bible teaches that the world has been completely darkened by sin. All who are outside of Christ are in spiritual darkness. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah spoke of the people walking in darkness, Isaiah 9-2. Paul said to the Ephesian Christians, you were once darkness, Ephesians 5, verse 8. The apostle Peter said that believers are those who are called out of darkness, 1 Peter 2, 9. Ever since Adam disobeyed, the human race has been alienated from God. Sin has darkened our minds, hearts, wills, and affections. Moses spoke of those who grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in darkness. One of Job's friends spoke of those who meet with darkness in the daytime. At noon, they grope as in the night. When the Lord spoke to Saul on the Damascus road, who said to him, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness and from the power of Satan to God. 
Writing to the Ephesians, Paul spoke of sinners having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. And to the Colossians, Paul said, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. Brothers and sisters, in contrast to the darkness of the fallen human race, the Bible says God is light and in him is no darkness at all. In John 8, boys and girls, what did Jesus say? I am the light of the world. The Apostle John declared that Jesus is the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. During his earthly ministry, Jesus dispelled the darkness from the hearts and lives of many. He brought light into the spiritual darkness of sinners' hearts. He not only opened the eyes of the blind, bringing them out of physical darkness, but with the word, he also brought many out of spiritual darkness. But Jesus knew that his earthly ministry would be brief. After his death and resurrection, he would ascend into heaven, and therefore he appointed his disciples and his church to be light bearers. Believers are to provide that spiritual illumination to a world that has been darkened by sin. What do we read in Matthew 5? You, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The church today is to continue that light-bearing mission, whether you're a senior, a mom, a dad, a child, a young man, a young woman. God wants you to be light. Paul said to the Ephesians, you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. He wants you to shine among your colleagues at work, your friends at school and university, your customers at the shop, your feed salesmen at the farm, wherever you may be, shine as lights in the world. Consider this. Perhaps you're the only light that some people will ever see. Perhaps you're the only light that some people will ever see. Well, last week we looked at verses 12 and 13 and considered what it means to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We said that Paul was not telling people to live in a constant state of nervousness and anxiety. God gives peace and security to those who trust his son. To work out your own salvation with fear and trembling is to actively pursue a life of sanctification and to ensure that the influence of your salvation permeates every aspect of life. Having been saved, we diligently pursue Christ-like obedience. Because this is such a challenging task, Paul says we ought to do it with fear and trembling. That is, with great humility, reverence, and awe, never wanting to grieve such a gracious, loving, and majestic God. And Paul also offer, offers a word of encouragement. He says, verse 13, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. You see, we're not alone. God is present with his people, renewing, transforming, and reshaping us into the likeness of Christ. He works at the level of your will, and he works at the level of your actions, both to will and to do. Well, having considered last week the challenge, work out your own salvation, and the encouragement, for it is God who works in you, we want to continue this morning with the witness. Working out your own salvation includes bearing witness for Him. We see this in verses 14 through 16. At the end of verse 15, Paul says that as children of God, believers are to shine as lights in the world or shine like stars in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. How do we do that? How do we shine as lights? What are some of the things that prevent you from shining? Several years ago, we had an old car and the headlights had become rather 
yellow, and fogged. They did not shine very well. Sometimes we professing Christians are like that. What are some of the things that prevent us from shining brightly in the darkness? Paul mentions a few of them here in these verses, and they remind us that working out our own salvation is a constant effort. The first thing that this text sets before us is the need to mortify a dissatisfied and discontented spirit. The need to mortify a dissatisfied and discontented spirit. Look with me in your Bibles to verse 14. Do all things without complaining or grumbling and disputing. This verse describes the attitude with which you are to work out your salvation without complaining and disputing. The word complaining there or grumbling is to mutter and gripe with an attitude of dissatisfaction and disgruntlement, a negative response to something unpleasant or disappointing. Every parent knows what that means, right? You say, Billy, it's time to stop what you're doing and clean your room. Oh, Mom, do I have to? My friends don't clean their rooms. What's the point of it? It just gets messy again anyway. Besides, no one sees it. I hate cleaning my room, and I'm busy doing something else. Complaining. Grumbling. Sometimes that happens between husbands and wives. You ever been visiting at a home where a man and his, and his wife are constantly complaining? Either the one or the other or both thinks he or she deserves better? It's not a nice place to be. Who wants to be in a home where you hear constant muttering, complaining, grumbling? And linked to the word complaining there is disputing. Complaining is largely emotional while disputing is more intellectual. Angry arguments and disagreements, bickering and overtones of with overtones of hostility, a contentious spirit that says, I'm going to fight you on that, I'll show you. But sadly, sometimes that attitude can also be found in the church. We saw two weeks ago how Paul emphasized the importance of unity in the church. Verse 2 says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Complaining, grumbling, and disputing inevitably threatens the unity of the body. Mrs. So-and-so doesn't like the way this is done or doesn't like the way that is done, and she's very vocal about it. Mr. So-and-so thinks this should be changed and that should be improved, and he doesn't like the way he's been treated. He deserves better. He's not getting the respect he deserves. When he talks to people about the church, it's always negative. He'll argue his point until people are sick of it. I've known situations, maybe you have as well, where parents drove their kids away from the church and the faith because they were constantly complaining, grumbling, and disputing. The pastor is this, and the elders are that. The preaching is too long or too short. It's too doctrinal or too simple. It's too, too much judgment or too much grace. The elders are too pushy or too lax. And why do we have to do this? Why can't we do that? The people are too nosy or too cold. The music is too loud or too soft, too fast or too slow. The Bible study is too personal or too intellectual. And their kids conclude, why would I want to be part of the church? Why would I want to go there? All I hear from my parents is criticism and negativity. They go to church every Sunday, but they're constantly whining about it. Why would I go there? Complaining, grumbling, disputing. Congregation, in verse 12, Paul stressed the importance of obedience in the Christian life. 
Those who are saved by Christ are called to display the obedience of Christ. Complaining, grumbling, and disputing are contrary to his character. He displayed an attitude of humility and contentment, denying himself for the good of others and giving himself for the well-being of the church. True confidence in God results in humble, active, joyful obedience. It enables us to do all things without complaining, grumbling, and disputing. Now, perhaps you noticed that some of the language that Paul used in these verses is similar to the language of Deuteronomy 31 and 32. And the circumstances are also rather similar. In Deuteronomy 32, the nation of Israel had been delivered from bondage. They had been in the desert for 40 years and were about to enter the promised land. Moses was soon to die. But before he went up to Mount Nebo, he wrote a song to remind the people of their past deliverances and to warn them of their obligations once they entered the land. The Apostle Paul, when writing to the Philippians, was in a similar situation. He believed that it would not be long before he would be taken out of this world to be with the Lord. Before he brought the gospel to the city of Philippi, the people had been caught in a life of sin. They were in bondage spiritually, even as Israel had been in bondage in Egypt. They would have remained in bondage were it not for the fact that God had so graciously called them to himself. But now that God had called them, they were to work out their salvation, working toward its completion, so that through their godly life, they will shine forth in brightness as the moon and stars against the blackness of the night. In Deuteronomy 32, Moses was able to prophetically look forward to the time when Israel was in the promised land, and what did he see? He saw Israel's terrible ingratitude, despite the faithful care which the Lord had shown them. Israel forgot their God and Father who brought them into being as a nation and claimed them as his own firstborn son among the peoples of the world. And because of their disobedience, what did Moses call them in Deuteronomy 32 verse 5? He called them a crooked and perverse generation a crooked and perverse generation. They had become a morally warped and distorted people, and consequently they were no longer a faithful witness to the surrounding nations as they were called to be. Had they been faithful, they would have stood out as stars in a dark sky. But instead, they blended right into the darkness and became no different than the surrounding nations. But congregation, what was one of the great sins that Israel is remembered for? They were a complaining, murmuring, grumbling, disputing people. When they were in Egypt, they murmured that they were in Egypt. When God took them out of Egypt, drowned the pursuing Egyptian army in the Red Sea, and brought them into the wilderness, only three days later they began to murmur because the water at Marah was undrinkable, Exodus 15. God graciously made the waters sweet and provided for them in a wonderful way. Nevertheless, the very next chapter, Exodus 16, we read that the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained, complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. You have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. The chapter goes on to describe how the Lord so graciously provided both meat and manna. But then we read in the next chapter, Exodus 17, that the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? Listen. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? You see, when they had no food or water, they murmured. When God graciously provided them with manna, they murmured about the manna. 
Numbers 21 says the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. Listen, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. They complained that they no longer had the fish, cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and the garlics of Egypt. Then congregation, after the 12 spies returned from spying out the land, Caleb and Joshua said, let's go up and take possession. The other 10 spies were afraid and insisted that the people of the land were too strong. It's a land that devours its inhabitants. They're giants in the land. We're like grasshoppers in our own sight. Being discouraged by the report of the ten spies, we read in Numbers 14 that all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And all the children of Israel, what? Complained against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in the land of Egypt. If only we had died in this wilderness. So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Complaining grumbling and disputing. They were so agitated and discontented that they were about to stone Joshua and Caleb. Finally, God refused to let them enter the promised land. Numbers 14, 26, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb and Joshua, you shall by no means enter the land. It was God's judgment upon complainers, grumblers, and disputers. Recalling that episode, the psalmist said in Psalm 106, they complained in their tents and did not heed the voice of the Lord. Also recalling that episode, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, let us not complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Let us not complain. Brothers and sisters, when the Israelites were finally brought into the promised land, they still murmured. And when Jesus came to earth, guess what? They murmured against him. John 6, 41 says, A people grumbled, complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. As their forefathers complained about the worthless bread in the wilderness, so they grumbled about the bread of life. You see, throughout their history, the Israelites murmured, disputed, and rebelled against the wisdom, kindness, faithfulness, and claims of God. And what happened? They were judged by the Lord and lost their witness to the world. They were like a candle immersed in a bucket of water. But now Paul writes to the Philippian church, and he says, you, you do all things without complaining and disputing, all things, all things. Congregation, when we submit to the will of God, placing our complete trust in Him without griping about the unpleasant things that the Lord may send into our lives, we will shine as stars in the dark sky. A dissatisfied and discontented spirit drives people away from us, from God, from the Word, from the Gospel, and hinders the work of the Lord. Conversely, a cheerful acceptance of one another and a joyful commitment to the body of Christ will make the Gospel attractive to others. We need to remember that our battle is with Satan who wants to destroy the church. 
And God wants us to stand together. He wants us not merely to tolerate one another, but to love and serve one another to display the humble spirit of Jesus. That servant spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, there are times when members of the body of Christ have both the right and the duty to speak out respectfully. Verse 14 doesn't mean that we say nothing when there is error, heresy, or ungodliness in the church. Paul himself confronted error when he saw the gospel being compromised. He even confronted Peter and withstood him to his face when he was eclipsing the truth of justification, Galatians chapter 2. No, Paul is not telling us to keep our mouths shut when the word of God is not being faithfully taught or the gospel of Christ is being watered down. But when Paul wrote this epistle to the Philippians, he was aware of unnecessary and petty conflict. In chapter 4, he mentions two women by name, Eodia and Syntyche, who were at odds. You get the impression that they were complaining about each other, and they were not of the same mind in the Lord. Paul reminded them that the Christian gospel should make us encouragers and forgivers rather than complainers and disputers. You cannot live a healthy spiritual life or build a healthy church with perpetually negative attitudes. Congregation, God wants us to humbly accept trials in our life without constantly griping about them. Sometimes that can be really hard. Sometimes that can be really hard. I can, I can imagine it wasn't always fun for the Israelites in the wilderness. Would you want to be there? Who wants to live in a desert? Who wants to go through the same routine one day after, the, after another? Who wants to eat the same food week after week after week? Who wants to run the risk of running out of water? Nevertheless, while we can understand their concern, their response was often totally inappropriate. Instead of trusting God and rejoicing in His saving grace, they complained and disputed. One theologian said this, I quote, A complaining and arguing spirit is an expression of ingratitude to God's providence and of lovelessness and pride toward others. It is a denial of grace. It is working against salvation rather than working salvation out into every aspect of our lives. In the face of the self-humbling of Jesus and the servant spirit which was his, murmuring and argument are ugly monsters. In the face of the self-humbling of Jesus and the servant spirit which was his, murmuring and argument are ugly monsters. Brothers and sisters, we are being called upon to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And part of that daily activity is to mortify a dissatisfied and discontented spirit. Put it to death. Put it to death. How can we put it to death? By reminding ourselves of the character of Christ. He never complained and grumbled about the Father's will for his life. As he approached the cross, he did not murmur and argue with the Father about dying there in shame. He went all the way to Calvary so that his people could be redeemed. Do we then have a right to argue when God brings challenging situations before us or when he leads us into some desert or valley? Do all things without complaining and disputing. That's the attitude with which we are to work out our own salvation. And then notice how Paul moves from the negative to the positive. Go to verse 15. Stop complaining and disputing, verse 15 that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. God wants his children to be blameless, harmless, and without fault. Another translation says blameless, innocent, and without blemish. 
The first word, blameless, is obviously not perfection. We won't achieve that in this life. But blameless is how God wants us to appear before a watching world. The Christian should not give the world any grounds for criticism. Think of Daniel, a man who lived in the midst of Babylonian godlessness, as corrupt a society as any. Yet when the governors, out of envy, tried to find some charge against him, they concluded, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Think about that. They couldn't find a charge against him. He lived an outwardly blameless life before others. That's the kind of life the Lord wants to see in his people. Blameless refers to moral integrity manifesting itself externally. God wants us to live in such a way that those who are around us, observing us, will never be able to find anything worthy of blame or reprimand. If the world hears and sees us complaining and disputing, our Christian message will not be attractive to them. The second word is harmless, sometimes translated innocent or pure. Harmless carries the idea of being unmixed, unadulterated, unalloyed, undiluted, without any mixture of evil. Harmless is moral integrity manifesting itself inwardly. What you are inwardly. Christians who complain and argue against God and each other are watered down. And like Israel, it immerses our candle in a bucket of water. Congregation, how does the world look at you and at me? Is your inward purity expressed outwardly in your business, your job, as an employer, as an employee, as a member of your community? Like the Philippians, We are living in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, verse 15. One is that is becoming increasingly crooked and perverse. Romans 1 is now an accurate description of life here in North America. And yet in the midst of it all, we are to be harmless and blameless. And to emphasize that necessity, Paul used a third phrase in verse 15. He said that children of God must be without fault or without blemish. Back in Deuteronomy 32, verse 5, Israel was described as being blemished. Blemished. And because of their stubborn disobedience, their light did not shine. According to Deuteronomy 32, rather than being in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, they themselves became a crooked and perverse generation. Their fear and trembling had vanished. Later on, when Peter preached at Pentecost, do you recall what he said to the people? Be saved from this perverse or crooked generation. Israel. Congregation, how far they had fallen. The church had become crooked and perverse. How weak their witness had become because there was no fear of God before their eyes, no reverential trembling. Again, how is it with us? What kind of a witness are you presenting to the world? Does your reverential fear of God cause you to shine as lights? Does your blameless, harmless, faultless character produced by the Holy Spirit reveal something of Christ to this dark world? The godly example of believers should preach sermons to those around us. And there's still more. We're not only to be a silent living witness, we are to be that, but there's more. We're we're to be a moral contrast with with society in terms of our actions, but, says Paul in verse 16, we are to hold fast or hold forth the word of life as a challenge to change that society. 
We are to hold it forth as though holding forth a torch. The word is also used for a lantern or a harbor beacon that is seen by all. Paul had held out the word of life to the Philippians. And now they must hold out that same gospel to others, for that is the means which God uses to drive away the darkness and straighten a crooked and perverse generation. Crooked lives can only be straightened by the grace of God. Ultimately, the only one who can make people straight is the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the cross and the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, if our churches today are characterized by complaining and arguing, rather than blameless, harmless, faultless living, our light will be extinguished and our impact on on this crooked and perverse world will be reduced to zero. If we want our light to shine, then we need to yield to God and to each other. Love one another, humble, sacrificial service. Jesus said, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. When you're committed to Christ, serving Him and following His example, the world may sit up and take notice. They may say, you know, those Christians have something. They've got something, something that I need. When you look around you, you listen to the news and observe the trends, it's not hard to see that our culture is very similar to that of the ancient world, crooked and perverse, morally warped and twisted, violent crimes, corruption in government, drunkenness, substance abuse, child abuse, divorce, sexual confusion, sexually transmitted diseases, rape, pedophilia, assault, intense spiritual darkness. But congregation, that is precisely where light is most necessary and most noticeable. That is precisely where light is most necessary and most noticeable. We are currently living in a dark world. But instead of lamenting the disintegration of our nation, let's keep our light shining brightly. Serve and love God and each other cheerfully. Display purity in your lives. Point sin darkened men and women to Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Hold forth the word of life, the message of the gospel. Jesus has come. He's died in our place and paid our debt. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Let that light penetrate the darkness of our world. Paul told the Philippians that if they did this, then he could rejoice that he had not invested his energy in vain. Look at verse 16. Holding for, fast or holding forth the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. If the Philippians stopped complaining and arguing, and instead displayed Christ-like harmony and love, letting their light shine, Paul would have reason to glory in the day of Christ. The believers he served will be a source of his eternal joy. Paul will be able to say with deep gratitude in his heart, I have not run in vain or labored in vain. And so, brothers and sisters, if we serve together with Christ-like harmony, humility, and love, holding forth the word of life, we too will be able to stand before Jesus Christ and rejoice. We have the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Let's let that light shine in our world. Don't let petty differences and human opinions extinguish the light. And if any of you here today are still living in spiritual darkness, 
know that Satan wants to keep you there. He doesn't want the light of the gospel to shine in your heart so that you're forgiven. The prince of darkness wants you to remain in darkness and bring you into eternal darkness. But if you acknowledge that you're a sinner, Believe that Jesus died and rose for sinners. If you put your faith in him, he'll forgive you, transform you, and let his light shine through you. I am the light of the world, said Jesus. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I am the light of of the world. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you and we ask that by your Holy Spirit you will work powerfully in us so that we will do all things without complaining and disputing, that we may be blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. May we shine as lights in this dark world. Lord, in many ways, we see in ourselves an image of the Israelites in the wilderness who constantly complained and disputed. And we have that tendency too in our own hearts and lives. We pray, Lord God, that you will change that in us, that you will work within us, and that, Lord, we may show to the world a spirit that is yielded to Jesus Christ. May we, both as individuals and church, as church corporately, may we let our light shine in the midst of the darkness and in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation. Lord, it's so necessary today as we see so much darkness and so much corruption. So we pray, Lord, use us here and root out these things that would hinder us, that would cause our candle to be placed in a bucket of water. Root out these things so that we may shine, that the world may sit up and take notice. Bless the words that have been spoken to our hearts. And will you deal graciously with us so that, Lord, through an attitude that is yielded to your will and through one that shows love to one another, truly we may be a church that makes the gospel attractive to outsiders. So, Lord, would you graciously deal with us that we may make that truth known to others. Thank you for Jesus, the light of the world. May each of us turn to him in faith and may his light shine through us. Amen.